atonement that God brought us through Jesus Christ our Lord. And uh, yes, these are all the feasts, the festivals of God. And I believe that I believe that um, it's good for Christians to know their roots. <laughs> we are grafted in, as it were, into the into the uh, house of Israel. Thank you, Lord. Being being Christians, we sometimes think, well, we don't need to study all those uh, Old Testament things. My Bible says, the scriptures say that we are supposed to study them so that we know where we come from and who we are. And the truth is, is that um, the festivals of Israel, the three in the spring, which you know as, as, a, as Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits, and then one in the middle of the year, the, the wheat harvest, which is, which is the uh, Pentecost. And then we have the three in the fall, and they're all three together, like the first three are all together. And so the the we have uh, we have gone uh, well. Actually, uh, Teruah is the day of trumpets, and then we have then we have uh, Yom Kippur. That's where I'm preaching today. That is the day of atonement. And then what actually happens that happened this week. Is tabernacles, and uh, we are. I, I'm, as I told you last week, I'm a, I'm a week behind, and much to my own chagrin, I didn't get it started on the right week. And it doesn't matter, does it? We're just learning because, to, to be honest with you, now that all of the first four have already been uh, fulfilled, in just as they were predicted to be fulfilled and prophesied to be filled. And we look forward, we see them, and we all rejoice. The last three are yet to come, and they are going to be fulfilled. And I believe just as, as they were prophesied to be fulfilled. And so we've already looked at trumpets. Hallelujah. One of these days, the trumpet's going to sound, and the dead in Christ are going to rise, and we, are, and we which are alive and remain will rise with them, and we will go to meet the in the clouds, we'll meet Jesus, and there starts our uh, our eternity. Actually, begins right then, as we are uh, brought into His presence, and then He uh, we will go through the the, the uh, uh, judgment seat of Christ, which will. Uh, it's not a are you get to go to heaven or not. You're going to heaven. It's what did you do with Jesus during the during this lifetime? Okay, and so we've already we've already looked at uh, trumpets, and, and the shofar has blown, and we have seen uh, the the catching away. And now, what is yet ahead for us is to, uh, a one that uh, that is already happened for us, but we get to celebrate with them. The, the Jewish mindset is still looking for the Messiah. And so to them, in their mindset, their atonement has not happened yet. And that's where our prayers need to be. For, we pray for peace in Jerusalem, as we're instructed in the, in the scriptures. But what will bring peace in Jerusalem is when they see the Messiah, the true peace of God, the shalom of God, the one who, who crushes the one who brings chaos. That's what the word shalom means. And we will be we will be caught up in that. So I want you to understand the Kippur, and it's like I say, it's already happened for them, and they are actually in tabernacles right now. But let's talk about this. You read that there is by whom we have now received the atonement was the last words that you quoted there through Jesus Christ, your Lord. Your atonement has already come. Amen. So if you're here and you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can say, hallelujah, it's already done, okay? But let's look back and let's learn a little bit about the, uh, the Day of Atonement. And, and we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 16, and I'm going to read a couple of verses, and then we're, going to, then we're going to catch up with all of this. Leviticus 16, 21 and 22 says, And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat. Now, remember, I'm going to go back and explain all this, but they brought two goats in. And the one what they the the, 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 the uh, cast lots, and the one whose lot it was to to die for the people 
when he brought, he uh, is slaughtered for the people. And the other one, the hands, the priest would lay hands on him and would confess the sins of Israel. And then he was sent out into the wilderness for that. I'm going to tie all of that to Jesus Christ here in a minute. All right, so just follow with me. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins, and he shall put on them uh, uh, on the head of the goat and put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all of their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. I want you to remember all of that because it's very important to what we're going to be looking at here in a second. Now then, the Fire Study Bible says this about the atonement. It says, without atonement for their sins, the people of Israel would have had to, would have, would have had to suffer God's judgment because God's perfect holiness and justice will not allow him to ignore sin. Therefore, a penalty had to be paid. Sin is so opposed to God's perfect nature that it requires the most extreme penalty and punishment, which is death. The purpose of the Day of Atonement was to provide one supreme sacrifice that would cover any and all sin and may, that may not have been covered in the sacrifices offered during the preceding year. In this way, the people would be spiritually cleansed and forgiven of their sins. This would also allow them to avoid God's wrath. Most of all, the Day of Atonement preserved their relationship with God. Praise God, your relationship is preserved in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you bless your word and that you bless the understanding of it, not only for the Holy Spirit to be on me that I may speak the words of God, but that the Holy Spirit would be on all of us that we would hear the word of God today. In Jesus' name, amen. So Yom Kippur, which is, which is the Day of Atonement, and we read in Leviticus 16, 34, it says, This will be a statute for you forever, the atonement which is made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all the sin, their sins. And Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. So the, the Day of Atonement is simply this. It's the holiest day in Jerusalem, the one and only day of the year that the high priest could go in by enter into the most holy place. And the purpose was for atonement and repentance. Okay, so just get this, just get this picture in your mind. That as they, as they, as the the, the the goats were sacrificed. First of all, there was, a, and we'll read this in a minute, but there was a bull offered for the the priest and his family, and to, for his uh, forgiveness of sins. And then they took the the two live goats, the one that they we call the scapegoat is set aside. The other one is is the that they he prayed over it. He he put the sins of Israel on that and slaughtered that animal. And as he did so, he would then catch it that time and he would take it back in behind the veil. One day a year, somebody was behind that veil. And that was that was whenever he went in there, he went in with great trepidation. They put a rope around his foot by tradition. He had bells on the bottoms of his of his robe because if he wasn't accepted, they sure weren't going to go in and get him, and they wanted to be able to drag him out of there. Okay, and so and so the, by tradition, they didn't just send him back there and say, "Oh, it's done." They were they waited with anticipation. Guess what? I'm going to talk about this later. But your high priest has already took his own blood. And went behind the veil as it was ripped from his death on the cross. That he took it and he took of that blood to the real Holy of Holies in heaven. And he offered it on the true uh, mercy seat in heaven for you and for me. And all you have to do is say, yes, Lord, I want that. I accept your salvation for me. And it's done. Okay. But what, and, and it would be for the Jews too if they would just do it. But what happens is, is they are still looking for their Messiah. He's already come. So they're kind of behind the ball on that one. They're kind of not, not able to be there. So it was the holiest day of the year whenever the high priest could enter into the, into the most holy place. Side note, you remember me telling you who the most holy place is for you? 
count you. He said, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Guess what that word temple means? It is used only of the most holy place, the holy rose. God sees you as the holy of holies. What happens when the holy of holies individually congregate in one place? That's the power of the church. We're gonna, we've been studying on the church. I'm going to get back to that. But just think of that. That's the importance of congregation. And no, I will not change from that. I will be here every man I can until death takes me. Okay? So, so this is the way that it is. Jewish people traditionally observe this holy day. And they usually spend about 25 hours fasting and, and praying and spending almost all the time in their synagogues. And even though God ordained regular burnt offerings and sin offerings during the year, uh, the, 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 the one sacrifice that would propitiate or appease his wrath uh, was here on this day. They saw it as this particular uh, festival. Okay, so often sins may have been forgotten to be confessed or whatever, and this took care of all of them. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4 through 6 says this, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats. This is, by the way, direct reference to the Day of Atonement. The bull for the priest and the goats. It was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you would have not have desired, but a body has you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. You see, the, the, see, God provided Jesus Christ a body so that he would have flesh and blood, so that he could be the perfect sacrifice. He never sinned, there was no blemish in him. All the rest of the, all the rest of, the, for all of those years, those sacrifices, they were a good attempt, but they weren't the, they weren't what God was looking for. He was looking for one thing, his son dying on the cross for you and for me. Leviticus 16, 3 says, in this way, Aaron came into the holy place with a bull from the herd of the, uh, the sin offering and a ram for the bird offering. The two goats that were brought in there were, and I'm going to quote Leviticus 16, 8 through 10. Here's how they were to handle them. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for Azazel. Remember that word, Azazel. The, if you've got another version, it may call it the scapegoat. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord to use as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it might be sent away into the wilderness of Azazel. Now, now, understand, how can both goats represent Jesus Christ? We know the sin offering, that he was our sin offering, but what about the one that was sent out into the wilderness? How does that re respond to who Jesus was? In this particular sacrifice, one goat was killed and the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat, and it took place on the Day of Atonement and was recognized as done by God as a substitute, uh, enough to withhold God's wrath back, okay? Now remember, all of those sacrifices pushed back sin, did not forgive sin, pushed it back and pushed it back and pushed it back. Because when Jesus Christ died on the cross, then my Bible says that he became sin, for us who knew no sin. Because all of those thousand years of sacrifices that did not forgive sin, all of that sin came rolling over onto him as he was on the cross. He took it all. He died for every one of those sins. And they are paid for if those people will allow that to happen. Okay? And then you and I get to have our sins forgiven when we ask Jesus Christ for salvation. All of the sins of the future, and I mean, this is where a lot of people disagree with me, but they're, they can be wrong if they want to. But the fact is, is that, is, is that you, those sins' future are also paid for already, but it makes it even more so that you need to put yourself in a position of gratefulness and confession of those sins at all times. That's the reason he said if, if we confess our sins, 
the, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's already been paid for. All you have to do is agree with God. I did that, God. I shouldn't have done that. Does anybody else have that problem, or is it just me that has to, that has to still say, oh, God, that, wouldn't, that shouldn't have come out of my mouth, or that shouldn't have happened, or whatever. Okay, get this idea of the two goats again, the scapegoat goat. The other goat, which was, which was chosen for, by Lot, after hands were laid on its head, the, sin, the sins of the nation confessed over it, and sent into a desolate mountain referred to as Azazel. It's an interesting thing. The scapegoat is called as we did. The place that he goes is called as they Okay? But I'm going to get one more. And the sins of the, of the people of Israel were set aside, and the goat was sent away from the holy camp. Now you understand. Now you can see it. They sent their sin away from the holy holiness of the camp. Okay? Azazel, or if you want to put it, actually what that means is the go away goat. Okay, it means that, the, that one goat was to go away. Okay, it's also in called in the book of Enoch. It was the name of one of the fallen angels. In the Bible, the name Azazel appears in association with the scapegoat, right? And the name represents the desolate place where the scapegoat, bearing the sins of the Jews during Yom Kippur, was sent during the whole the, during the second temple period. He appears as the following fallen angel again, responsible for introducing humans to forbidden knowledge. Does that sound something that might have happened in Eden? And his role as a fallen angel partly remains in Christianity as well as Islamic traditions. Okay, do you get this? Azazel is Satan. Okay, he is a fallen angel. His name is Satan. By the way, can you get me one more scripture that goes with that, where Jesus fulfilled that by going into the wilderness to Azazel and being tempted by him for 40 days? Okay, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When Jesus went out there, he was your scapegoat. He was taking those sins of us already out into the wilderness. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, And he, he was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, Jesus knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So to the Jew, atonement is still a time that is coming. He said, if my people which are, which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. That applies to the fact that he's still waiting for Israel to come to him and to confess the, their need for Jesus as the only sacrifice that could take away sin once and forever. And then he sat down at the right hand of God. They're still, he's still waiting for them to do that. The, um, Psalm 51, 16 and 17 says, For I will not delight in sacrifice, or else I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite heart, O God. You will not despise. I was watching an interesting thing on, on the, uh, on, during the Holocaust. Whenever when we were talking about it in Sunday school a little bit this morning, but during the Holocaust, it, the the Jews got so despondent that literally the rabbis started saying, "Pick another people, God. We can't handle this." Listen, the, Jesus died for all. He's not going to pick another people. The Israel is going to be His people, but guess what? You are. As Christians, you are grafted into Israel. You are grafted into that, uh, to that vine bush, if you will, of the rootstock of Israel. So you can celebrate these festivals in remembrance that you too belong there. Okay? I don't think we should get into a position of worshiping them. But let's do worship Jesus who brings atonement into our lives. So let's turn for a second in the turn a corner and say, for the Christian, for the Christian, atonement is, is not uh, what might be. Rather, 
It's, been, it's what's been given to us by Jesus Christ now. Okay? In order for our sins to be dealt with, we too are obligated to view any and all sins for our uh, lives, confessing and repenting over them in a daily manner. Now, I want you to know that during the Yom Kippur, the Jews are, go through a time of, of repenting and confessing their sins and wishing for a Messiah to come. And you are also called upon to confess your sins, agree with God, to look at His atonement and repent and say, thank you, Jesus, for the atonement that is already there. We're not waiting for an atonement. We have an atonement. Thank you for that. And so for our sins to be dealt with, we, we must view our sins as heinous before God, absolutely unbearable to God, and He will not let them in His camp. Okay? But you and I have the blood of Jesus Christ, and that blood is sufficient to forgive all sins. We have a scapegoat called Jesus Christ, who took our sins and was driven into the wilderness, and He already met with Satan and defeated him there. Don't let me get away from that. You already have a defeated enemy. You didn't do a thing, did you? You couldn't have. There's nothing you could have done to defeat Satan. Matter of fact, even the angels do not come against him by word at all. They say, the Lord rebuke you. And we need to remember that when we... When we stand up and call our ground with, with Satan, we need to make sure that we remember to say, I belong to Jesus Christ through the blood of the sacrificial Lamb of God. I belong there. You have no right in my, play, in my life. So therefore, in the name of Jesus, leave. You do not do it on your own power. You'll get what, you, what the sons of Sceva got in Acts. Okay, you can you're liable to get jumped on and strip your clothes off and you'll make you run off down the road. Okay? So let's not try that, all right? <laughs> now then, let's move on. Atonement is what has already happened for us. As a Christian, Romans 3, 24 through 26 says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation. You remember what the word of propitiation? Propitiation, same word, means the mercy seat on the, of, on, the, on the Ark of the Covenant. And it's where the sacrifice of acceptance was put on that, on that mercy seat. It's the acceptable sacrifice through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. God knew they would be saved by Jesus, and He forbear. He, he pushed back those sins all over that time, okay? Through the forbearance of God to declare at this time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him who believeth in Jesus. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven by the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, and the blood that went on the mercy seat of God propitiates for your sin. And not only that, at the same encounter with God, when you crawl out, call out to Jesus Christ for your salvation, He declares on you His righteousness, not yours. Because we don't have anything to do with it. Anybody in here feel righteous? It better be only through Jesus. Okay. Because there is no other. So from Romans 5, 9 through 11, let me read another set. It says, much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So we are justified. You know what the word, big word justified means? It says its own description. Justified never sinned. Okay, so just think about it. He makes you justified just as if you had never sinned. He says that He that we are justified by His blood, that we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if we, we uh, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we will jo also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have received the atonement we read that, okay? Just want to keep it in front of you. 
1 John 2, 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may know, or sorry, wrong, wrong memory verse. I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. <laughs> Side issue. These little girls in, in, in learning memory verses and you learning memory verses, they're in there. And they'll come out at the, at the, at the time when you want them. Sometimes I start a verse and it goes to another memory verse. But praise God for memory verses. You're not too old to learn them. Keep going, okay? But let's, let's put it this way. So the advocate, to be able to bring reconciliation with God, he had to make a perfect atonement for our sins. Whenever we see in Leviticus 16 that he said that uh, the atonement was going to be made for you, there's several things that have to be the same now as they were then. First of all, the sinner must confess. I already quoted 1 John 1, 9, and that is, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the sinner has to confess. Second of all, the, we have, just as the pattern of the Old Testament states, the sinner needs to be of a contrite countenance. We need to be able to see the, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. Psalm 51, 17. There has to be a sacrifice of blood. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the righteous riches of his grace. It has to be a perfect blood sacrifice. Can't be just anything. Had to be perfect. The blood that sprinkled on the mercy seat had to be absolutely perfect. Okay? That's the reason for all those years they weren't forgiven. They were appeased. God was appeased. Because now, when Christ died on the cross, never sinned. Never any blemish in his body. Never anything that would discount him from being your sacrifice. And he willingly went to the altar. It's as if they pulled that little sheep or goat out of, the, out of, out of there and, the, and he runs to the slaughter. That's what Jesus did for you. Is because you have an almighty, absolutely perfect blood sacrifice. 1 John 2, 1 through 2 says, My little children, these things write I unto you that that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. You see, when Jesus went to the cross, he went to the cross as if you, if you had been the only one alive, he would have died for you. But it so happens that you weren't the only one, so he died for the entire world. All of the sin of all of the world was paid for on Calvary. And that blood has already been taken to the mercy seat in heaven and sprinkled for you and for me and for every other person in this world. It's been paid for. Now all you have to do is accept it. You can't get any better than that, guys. You can't pound it any flatter. All you have to do is agree with God. I have to have that. I confess my sin. I agree with you. The, spring, the priest had to sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat. Again, guess what Hebrews says? Hebrews 9, 12 through uh, 14 says that Jesus was the high priest. And he said he entered in once and, and, and for all into the holy places, not by means of goats and blood of goats and uh, goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption you were bought eternally. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of the defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctified the purification of the flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I learned something from my, from my old pastor this morning, uh, watching his uh, sermon in Florida. Conscience. I never put this together before. The word conscience comes from two root words. Con, with, science, knowledge. It means that you did it with knowledge. 
you sinned against God knowing you were sinning against God. And he forgave you for that. Our consciences have been purified from those dead works by a living God. The scapegoat had to be chosen. That was Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus was our scapegoat. Atonement had to be made. Romans 5, 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom now we have received the atonement. You stay, sit here with me today. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have atonement already. When you look at the Day of Atonement, it's like, wow, this. It's not, oh Lord, come. It's, you did this for me. You did this for me. That's the reason why we can't show. That's the reason why, Jackie, we, we have to worship. We have to. It's because it is already here for us. Justification is the result. Justification means that Jesus makes us just as if we never sinned. He covers our sin with his own son's blood. He forgives our iniquities never to see our sin anymore. And he re reconciles us to himself. You know what? I got to thinking about this and meditating on this. God forgave your sin so fully when you asked him to that he doesn't even know it's there anymore. You say, well, God, being God, knows everything, right? Yes, he does. But there are some things he chooses not to know. Jesus chooses not to know the day that he's coming back in the rapture at trumpets to get us. He says no one knows. Not even the, on the Father alone. Not me, not the angels in heaven. This is something else he chooses not to remember, is he chooses not to remember your sin after you have confessed it to him. He doesn't know it's there anymore. There's an old, old song, and I, Beck, I told Becky we need to drag it out and work on it, and then you, me and her will sing it for you someday. But it's called, it's, 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 it's like he says. Sins do you talk to me about? What's it? Yeah, well, sins, I started to say it, and then another word jumped in my mind, and I couldn't get it out of there. What sins are you talking about? I meant, he says, I don't remember them anymore. In the book of life, they're all washed out. I don't remember them anymore. Listen, Jesus looks at you when you, when Satan, see, this is the key thing to remember. Satan, Azazel, who would love to destroy you, will drag your old sins back up and show them to you. Okay, over and over and over. And, and, we, and he gets so good at it that what he does is he teaches us how to do it. And pretty quick, we're like the little kid with a dead cat. And he goes out and he loses his cat and he's so sad and so he buries his cat in the ground but he decides it'll be good because he's a little country boy. I wonder what's going to happen to that cat so he leaves the tail sticking out of the grave. And he goes out there every day and he pulls that cat back up and looks at that cat and then buries that cat back up and he keeps that tail there. And one day he went out there and he didn't think it was the rock and he pulled the tail off the cat. But you know, here's, the, here's my whole point of all of that gross story for the kids. And that is just simply this. Too many times we Christians are kind of like that little boy and we want to pull our sin back up and look at it and see how disgusting it is. And then we want to bury it back down and go to church and do the, but we keep digging the dumb thing back up again. Can, you, can I just convince you? God leaves it there, leave it there. Don't let Satan tempt you into digging that old thing back up and, and saying, I'm sorry again and again. Jesus has already forgiven it, washed it away. Now you're free. Now you're free. So the Christian has already had his day of atonement. Justification means God says that we, he, he never remembered it. He covers our sinfulness in his son's blood. He forgives our iniquity, never to see our sin anymore. And he reconciles us to himself. Now then, Christian, can you please, when you hear of Yom Kippur come up, you praise God that your day of atonement has already happened. It's already paid for. 
The sin is already done. You don't have to dig it up no more because he's not going to. And there's only one that has the right to dig up your sin anymore, and that would be God. He chooses not to. Learn a lesson from him, not Satan. Praise him for your personal atonement. Can I ask you this? How sin is it in your life that you keep wanting to say, I'm sorry, God, I remember doing that. Maybe nobody does it with me, but I do. I dig them things back up and wish I had never done. I think of things that I should have never, never done as a kid and, and even later in my life. And I just want to constantly say I'm sorry to God. And His atonement is so precious. It's not there anymore. So if you're going to do anything on the Day of Atonement, praise God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God for the forgiveness of sin. Praise God for the scapegoat that took out into the wilderness and met, met Satan head on and answered him with the word of God time after time after time until Satan had nothing more to say and left. Because that's your scapegoat. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Our sins are forgiven. They're never to be remembered anymore. They're as far from us as the East is from the West. The Bible says he puts them behind his back. Never to see them ever again. I don't know about you, but I say hallelujah. Let's go to the